So guys, got a video blog here for you. It doesn't come from one individual, but multiple people. I'm talking about from Facebook pages, the emails, a diverse crowd of people all coming up with the same thing. Talking about genetic limitations. Is that true or not? Is there any kind of bearing to that? Can I only go so far? And then no matter how much effort I give, I'm flatlined, plateaued off. I can never get any further. It's probably the question that's been asked from the very, very beginning of the history of modern bodybuilding. Everyone wants to know what this is all about. Is there any truth behind it? And if you research it from scientist approach and scientific evidence to the street credit of bodybuilders and stuff, you will have different ideologies and different people thinking different ways of what the real truth is about this. Do genetics play a role? Or is it just a lazy man's excuse for why they're not in shape? Let's get into this a little bit. Um, Genetics, what are we talking about here with genetics? The genetics of somebody to build muscle mass. We're talking about the different types of fibers, muscle fibers in the body, being a fast twitch or a slow twitch. The fast twitch muscles are your speed and I mean your power. That is what's building the muscle. Where the slow twitch is your endurance, your marathon runner, the ability of a muscle to continue to work over a period of time. Where the fast twitch is just that explosive nature. There is a predetermined genetic code on what, how much of each you have, the proportionality between fast twitch and slow twitch that is a genetic gift of somebody, right? You also have the neuroefficiency of the body, the way for your body to touch and react and everything, the speed of which. That is something that's predetermined. You also have a predetermined ability to extract oxygen within the muscles, as well as ability to recycle and recharge your ATP levels of the muscle. You have skeletal muscle that's, that's definitive. You have bone density that's, that's different. You have hormone levels that are different. All of these things, you also have genetic mutations within everybody. All of these elements are your genetic gifts, the genetic codes, and they are set in stone. You can improve a little bit, a little bit of variance, we're talking one or two, three percent maybe, but not enough to really make a difference. So your quick answer is yes. You are limited to your genetic structure, what you're born with. Does that matter? Fuck no, it doesn't matter. All those gifts, all that genetic material I just talked about, you know, I always talk in metaphors, so here's a metaphor for you. All that stuff is building material to build a house. You just went to Home Depot and bought all that genetic shit, right? You can only go once. So you're born with a, a supply of genetic material, a supply of building materials. You know, you're talking about your, your two by fours, your, your, your travertine, beautiful travertine and beautiful granite stone, right? You have your mahogany woods. All that shit is sitting outside your driveway, pissing your neighbors off because you have a land that you just demolished and it's about to go into a construction zone. And your neighbors are hating it because you have all this beautiful material sitting on the driveway just, just being an eyesore to everybody else. But yet it has the potential and the genetic code to be something magnificent. So do you see what I'm getting at, guys? Those, those building blocks that we were born with, right, are sitting there and they are worthless until we get the construction workers in here to build a motherfucker and make it something powerful. So everyone starts talking about like, oh, well he's just genetic gifted, that's why he's so look, looking so good. Or, yeah, I got fired because the boss hates me. No, maybe, you're, maybe we need to start taking some credit, right? Maybe your job performance is shit. That's why you got fired. Or, you know, God, that, that, that kid right there is just, you know, he's trouble. He's trouble. Must, you know, yeah, he must have shitty parents. Uh, maybe so. Maybe the parents didn't give the work into the child to make the child something else. There's always an excuse factor or, or a reason for everybody. And the one I love the most is the one that everyone calls me out. Oh, he, he's on steroids. He's on steroids. Dude, that piss. I mean, it's, it's a compliment now because I appreciate it now because I've never done that motherfucking shit. And everyone thinks I have. So if I can do that and impress so many people and piss so many people off with never doing it, that must be doing something right. So I take it as a compliment. But it still pisses me to all ends. That someone out there is so weak mindset that like, oh, Greg must be doing steroids because it looks like that and I look like this. No. The difference between me and them is the same difference between having all the genetic material on your driveway and a flat land 
to putting the genetic material of building blocks into a structure of a house. It's called the construction workers. The people that go and build it and put the effort into it. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about something that's up here, guys. It's not the genetic part anymore. It's the working bee. That's what it's about. We're talking about intensity of your workouts, how hard you go and everything else. Your duration, how frequently you go. The rest in between your workouts and the nutrition you put in. Those four factors are your construction zones. They are your workers that you're hiring to take all that genetic gift, all that raw material and build a structure of a house that makes everybody when they're driving by pump the brakes and look and be like, Whew, that's a house right there. Wow, I like that house. It looks good. It looks a lot better than the house next to it. Both the same size. Both the same potential. Yet this, this house, my fucking house, right? I cut the grass. I trim the bushes. I got lights on the house. I paint the, you know, the, the porch. You know, the other house next door, it's got weeds in the garden. The paint's chipping. The windows are dirty and everything else. Don't, not putting the time into it to polish and make your potential, what you can be, those raw materials shine, sparkle to the nth degree, to stand out, to be something different. Yes, are there bigger houses with greater views over the ocean and everything else? Sure. You had that genetic gift, the money of which to build something like that in that situation. But it's not about where you start in life, guys. It's where you finish. The differential. If you're a kid that grows up on the streets, you know, in a rough neighborhood, and majority of all your people, all your, all your, all your compadres, right, go to jail, sell drugs, right, and you break through that and become a professional lawyer, doctor, you know, pro athlete or something like that, you started somewhere here and you went to here. Wow, look at that difference. That's a life right there. Or you're somebody that's built, I mean, born with a silver spoon in their mouth. You know, and they feed off their parents from, you know, inheritance and everything else. Distance traveled, fucking nothing. Or someone's built with a silver spoon, born with a silver spoon, that goes all the way up here and starts a whole new trend and, and you know, a new business and everything else. It's an opportunity and makes it grow. Life is about the distance you travel, not about where you start. Not about the materials in the driveway. It's what you do with those materials, that potential, that gift that the Lord has given you. What you created that. There's a parable in the Bible for the people that are religious and stuff. And, you know, it's about, the, about a king, right? And he has, he has his fortune, his gold. And he's traveling out of town. So he divvies up the gold to three different individual people. And says, you take a third, you take a third, you take a third. Right? One person takes that gold and buries it in the ground, and hides it, because he's afraid of it being robbed, stolen, or anything else. He wants to make sure that the investment that the, the king gave him, the, 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 the responsibility, is delivered back, and he gives him the money back, right? Another person goes out and, and, and kind of invests it, you know, and actually makes that little bit of money that, he, that the Lord gave him, I mean, the, the king gave him, into a little bit more. So he, when, you know, the, the, the third guy goes out there and gambles it. And he loses everything. So the king comes home and he's like, yo, three guys, where's my money? One guy fucking digs it out of the ground. Here it is. All the money you gave me, intact. Boom. He's like, okay. He goes to the other guy. What, what about you? He's like, well, I invested it a little bit, you know, and, and here's your money plus a little bit. And then the other guy says, how about you? And he goes, well, um, you know, I had an opportunity. I thought it would be good. I gambled it and I lost it all. And out of those three people, which person did the king despise the most? You probably think the guy that gambled and lost it all, but no. What he despised the most was the person that buried it in the ground and did nothing with an opportunity given to him. He didn't live. We all fail in life, guys. We succeed and we fail. It's what we do with it. It's that, you know, the, the guy that invested, he went for it. Good for him. The guy that went and gambled, at least he tried, you know? He had an opportunity given to him, a blessing given to him, a genetic code given to him, and he tried to make the most he could out of that. You see what I'm getting at, guys? Fuck the genetic code. And if you get caught up in the situation where you're like, oh, I can't grow anymore because of my genetics, you're that lazy motherfucker I'm talking about before. He likes to point his finger at everybody else saying, oh, the only reason why this guy is better than me is because he was gifted. 
The gifts, guys, are the raw materials in the driveway that make the neighbors pissed off because it looks like shit. The real power that it distinguishes someone from being remembered or forgotten are the construction workers. Your intensity, your duration, you know, how many times you go to the gym, your nutrition, and then the, uh, the last one being your rest in between your workouts. Those are the, mon those are the fundamental blocks that take the, r the raw materials of, of what could be muscle and forms it into actual fiber building muscle. Okay. So to break this down even more, the genetic code, right? Of all those things, the one thing that is distinguished the most is a fast twitch to slow twitch muscles, okay? Fast twitch being the ones that really, the more fast twitch muscles you have proportionally to slow twitch, the more genetic gifts you have and the ability you can really get strong, okay? Um, if you look at a bell curve in society, and don't go out and get a you know muscle biopsy here, guys. They're really painful. They're really expensive and everything else. A muscle biopsy is the one that would determine like a, like a, a body fat percentage, what your body fat is. It tells you how much fast twitch you have to slow twitch to tell you what your potential could be. It doesn't even matter what your potential is. Your potential's in your head. You know, you shoot for the stars. If you land on the moon, you're still better than anyone else on the mountaintops. You know what I'm saying? So you have fast twitch and slow twitch. Now there are some people that are majority fast twitch. There are some people the majority slow twitch. The slow twitch again is the endurance and the ability for a muscle to maintain an activity over time for a period of time, duration of time, where your fast twitch is just that power and explosiveness. Okay? The people that are genetically get to more fast twitch and slow twitch is about one tenth of the population. One tenth. The people with more majority slow twitch and fast twitch is again about one tenth. We have a natural bell curve here. We're all ultimately slow twitch to ultimately fast twitch, one tenth, one tenth. Then you have majority slow twitch, minority fast twitch, 15%. Same on the other side. Majority fast twitch, minority slow twitch. And then you have the normality, which is 70% of the population, which has a pretty much, give or take, an equal spread of fast and slow twitch. Now, if we look at the bodybuilders out there, and if you guys want a quick test, real fast, <clears throat> of what, besides going through like a muscle biopsy and everything else, there's an 80% roll test that you guys can do. 80% roll is this. To find out if you have majority slow twitch or fast twitch muscles. Okay, so you take your max, whatever exercise you want, whatever the ones you're, you're great, so squat or bench press, whatever, is whatever your max is for one rep max on a bench press is a set. Let's say that's X weight, right? 80% of X weight is the weight you're gonna lift. You're gonna lift it and you're gonna get underneath there fresh and you go as many times as you can. If all you can do, 80% of your max, is rep count between one and three reps, you are extremely fast twitch muscle bound. If you can go from like three to six, majority fast twitch. If you go from like six to nine, you know, you probably have a little bit more fast and slow. Anywhere from like 10 to 13, 14, Normality, that's that, that, that 70% arc I'm talking about, where everyone else is, on 80% max. And as we start going more and more down the line, down to like 20 reps, you have the, the polar opposite. From the one to two reps is a total fast twitch kind of guy or girl, to the 20 rep plus is a total slow twitch kind of guy. Majority of you guys, you get underneath the bench press of 80% max, you're going to find your rep count somewhere between 8 to 12. And that's where everyone is. And if we look at society throughout modern bodybuilding, you know, there is that Darwinism effect, right? That Darwinism effect with like, you know, survival of the fittest and we start getting more and more stronger and bigger. You look back in the day, I used to, I used to live in um, Virginia, an old town Virginia, a very historic town. Um, you can't really do much modification to some of the homes there. And it's bizarre because you walk into these homes that are built like the 1700s or, you know, and, and you get to duck underneath the doorways because people back then were shorter. You know, but now we're bigger, you know? So we start to evolve, you know, we start to push the barrier some. Our genetics will start to come more and more, the Darwinism effect, right? But if you look in the bodybuilding realm, for once it became the modern bodybuilding, we're talking probably, the, you know, the 60s on, right? The guys that are competing, we're not looking at somebody that's now 500 pounds ripped up on steroids, just cut, are we? No. It's still from Arnold's day to the current day. We're still, we're only talking about 30 pounds, maybe. It's not a huge much of a difference. 
to make it even more relevant to you, look at natural bodybuilders. Natural bodybuilders, no steroids attached, right? You don't see too many natural bodybuilders in contest shape, I meaning totally depleted. You know, the, the water, the carbs, everything sucked out. Body fat's extremely low. Over 200 pounds, do you? No. You see a few of them, but the majority of the competition is around like a buck sixty. You know, that's the, the natural progression where it is. That hasn't moved that much. Majority of society, these guys, that are just big and everything else. It's not that they have more raw materials in the driveway. They have more drive. They have more workers building it. They have more dedication. They have more, you know, endurance, intensity, and duration, and rest, and nutrition. They've mastered those principles of turning a blessing that the king gives them in gold and turning it into something and going for it and risking it. That's what makes a difference, guys. So if you guys are trying to gain weight and everything else and, 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 and you've gone, you know, initially you started, it went real well, right? And now you feel like you're kind of plateauing off. Well, think of that, you know, think of a mountaintop, right? The mountain, when you first climb that mountain, you're climbing Everest, you know? or mountain potential here. The base of the mountain, the circumference is gigantic. There's so many ways to come up and start to, to gain, gain elevation. Meaning just going to the gym, anything you do will promote some kind of change in results. Because it's new, it's shocking the system. You're climbing the elevation, you're moving, you're moving, moving. You know, you go 20, 30%, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80%, 90% up the mountain. So many pathways, but when you get to the top, trying to get to that pinnacle, the last 10% of life, the one that makes all the difference. The pathways to the top are very limited, are they not? Yes, they are. Meaning you have to constantly change the workout up. Constantly shock the system in order to see that growth. You have to work even harder for it. And that makes all the difference between a champion and forgotten about. So you guys that are working out, just starting out, right? Your natural progression is going to be huge. The first year of a bodybuilder, right? What he g gains in a year could be up to 20 pounds of muscle in a year. And this is all reported stats. I'm not making this shit up. These aren't just numbers in my head, guys. You can gain up to 20, 25 pounds. One to one and a half percent of your body weight per month in a beginner one year bodybuilder. Doing it right with the right nutrition, duration, you know, intensity and rest. You can gain one to one and a half percent of your body weight of muscle mass a month for in that first year. That's huge. You take somebody in the second year. Now he knows more, right? He should be even growing even more. No, what happens? He drops down. Now we're talking about like a half a percent to one percent of your body weight per month of muscle mass. Third year drops down even more. Fourth year drops down to like you know, 0.25 to 0.5% of your body weight per month. The natural span of all of that, guys, in a four-year span, 40, 50 pounds of muscle mass gained. That's about it. And then it starts to whittle down. So if you're somebody that's like a buck 30, buck 40, you jump up to about, you know, 190, 200. I'm talking about a body fat percentage that's low. You know, body fat percentage down to like, you know, like five to eight percent, you know, real solid. That's what it's going to be. That's going to be taking the raw materials in that driveway and making the house as spectacular as possible. My house isn't that big. You know, I'm a fitness guy. You know, so let's do a metaphor here. I'm not a big bodybuilder with a mansion. I'm a fitness guy who makes the most use of every square inch of the house. Every square inch gets love, gets use. Tells a story, has my signature touch on it. When someone comes to my house, they feel warmth. They feel alive, they feel relaxed. They feel like, man, I, I, I can chill here. You see these other houses are gigantic. Big rooms no one ever goes into. Echoes and stuff, and it's kind of got this cold air to it. I don't know. It's about taking what you have and making the most of it, guys. And the longer and longer and longer and longer you've been working out, the higher and higher and higher you're going on that mountain, the harder and harder it is to climb to the top. That's why when someone's training, natural love of a sport, genetic gift, you know, natural ability, will get you to the state championship in high school, right? Of that sport, and you're feeling like that you're the man, you know, you're the big fish in a little pond. 
Then you go to college, competing in the same sport. Not in a pond now, you're kind of like a small sea, you know, in the Caribbean. After that, then you go into the Olympics or maybe professional sports. Now you're in the Atlantic Ocean. Competition gets harder and harder and harder. And the differential becomes seconds and inches. These small margins in life that make the difference between winning and losing. You look at Michael Phelps when he was swimming, right? When that one, when he won the eight gold medals, what was it, 0 0.01 seconds between him and his competitor from gold to silver? Hmm. How do you train for that? You don't train for that thinking about, oh, he's genetic gifted or not. No. It's about the mindset saying, fuck that. I don't give a shit what anyone says. I'm going to make this happen. These miracles in life, these people in wheelchairs. Doc's like, man, you never fucking walk again. They get up and walk one day because they said that they said to themselves, I'm gonna walk. Now we're talking about something. A kid that's got cancer, mental cancer, you know, in his head. Given six months to live, right? Six months to live. You know, and he loves this game, uh, asteroids. You know that old asteroids game where you got that little tiny square thing and it shoots up these things that come down and he shoots and he plays this game all the time right and so you're talking to him and he's like yo man have a good night he's like you know fun playing that game and everything else with you he goes i'm gonna continue playing it tonight in my head you know doctor says six months and that's it man priest came in read the last rites to him remission free right now cancer free in remission wasn't supposed to live six months. That was ten years ago. He was playing asteroids in his head, mindset, boom. And he defeated something that medically couldn't happen. How does that happen? I don't know. You start saying, oh, am I, am I genetically, you know, impervious to grow anymore? Yeah, you are. And it's not about genetics. It's because mentally you just gave the fuck up. But let's say you've been training a lot, guys, and you're really into winning and everything else. Couple tips here, couple tips here to really shock that system, blow, blow it up. To really increase muscle mass and everything else, you have to shock it up. Got like six or seven different options here for you. First thing is actually the load you're lifting, the weight of what you're lifting. Go in there and do a whole nother cycle of your normal routine, but just go heavy, heavy. Lower reps, you know, four, six reps per set, heavy, okay? Another duration workout, you know? Go in there and increase your volume. So you drop the weight. Now all of a sudden you're doing like 40 reps per set. Totally different than anything you did. So one's the weight volume, right? One's the volume of the reps. Next one I had to offer here. Time duration in between sets. So instead of taking 30 seconds off, that's what you're used to, take a minute off. And it'll be a longer workout, take a minute off. Do that for a whole cycle of your routine. Or if you're taking a minute or a minute and a half off, go to 30 seconds. Try that for a cycle, okay? The next one isn't the duration in between sets, but the duration in between reps. Lighten the weight and just go for speed. No longer a two second, I mean a four second down, two second up. I'm just saying pump it out as fast as you can like you're boxing the motherfucker. Go for that for a cycle. Next thing I'd say, go eccentric. Guys, that fast twitch thing I was telling you about, the most strain of the fast twitch is not in the concentric contraction if I'm doing bicep curls. It's not curling it up that pops the fast twitch muscles. It's the lowering, the, the, the negative, the, uh, that's the eccentric portion of the lift. That is what puts the most strain on the fast twitch muscles. Start so designing your whole work around the negative portion of your reps. Lowering the weight, heavier weight. weight or if you're doing a bicep curl, holding the weight, having your partner pull it from you and you hold it from them. <laughs> Get ready for the growth there. And the last thing I would say guys, start incorporating complex lifts. Complex, complex lifts would be like in legs, like, like your leg extension, simple lift, you know. Um, leg press, you know, on the machine, a little bit more complicated. Squat, most complicated. You see the difference there? One's isolated on a machine, right? Only one muscle working. The leg press is working multiple muscle movements in a machine, isolated. Squat, free weight, you, you're utilizing everything. Stabilize your muscles, plus your hamstrings, your, your glutes, your quads, everything. So it's more complex. Start, start organizing your workouts around all complex movements. All those 
examples, guys, is going to start breaking plateaus. And it's going to increase the intensity of your workouts. You know, that intensity, the duration, your rest, your nutrition, those are, those are the working elements. Those are the working bees. Those are the construction workers that's going to take whatever the materials of, of genetic code you have on your driveway and create the most magnificent structure you possibly can. That's something to be proud of, guys. And that's all we can do in life. The rest of it doesn't matter, you know? You know, it's not about, you know, where we end up in life. It's about the distance we travel. Great play, help me stay fed, man. I get emotional on this shit, man. <laughs>